Welcome to today's webinar, Risk Management and Quality Across the Value Chain, sponsored by Quality. I'm Dirk Ducharme, Editor-in-Chief for Quality Digest, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Your job, as you know, as an ISO 9001 registered manufacturer, is to implement and meet the requirements of ISO 9001, while at the same time making sure your company meets the demands of its customers, both in quality and delivery. So no problem, but when you add the complexity of global suppliers and contract vendors, meeting regulatory requirements and supporting corporate initiatives, all while working with paper-based processes or maybe outdated systems, then maybe in that case you've kind of set yourself up for the perfect storm of risk. So we're going to address that today. Uh, in today's webinar, we're going to learn how to balance ISO 9001 requirements and internal risk management, develop the groundwork for risk management success, reduce supplier and contract vendor uh, risk, and create the business case for a quality management solution. But before I introduce today's speakers, just a reminder that at any time, you can send questions to us using the Q&A box. You can find the Q&A box in the lower right corner of your screen. Just send a question to us anytime. Uh, and a recording of this webinar as well as a slide of the PDF uh, will be available one day after the webinar. So just keep your eye open uh, for your, in your in -mia email inbox, and you'll see a, a, an, uh, an email that will have both a link to the PDF and a link to the recording. Okay, let's get started. Today's presenter is Kelly Kuczynski, Quality and Document Control Product Marketing Manager at Cority. Kelly has 20 years of product management and marketing experience with a focus on CPG, chemicals, life sciences, and technology. Prior to joining Quarity, she led marketing and industry solutions for enterprise SaaS and quality management software solutions across multiple industries. She also held product management and marketing positions at Merck Chemical, Checkpoint Systems, and GE Capital. Okay, Kelly, it's all yours. Great. Thanks, Dirk. Let me move forward, so I apologize. Okay, there I go. Um, so, as Dirk already mentioned, we're talking about risk management and quality across the value chain and your facility by increasing your visibility. So when a company thinks of quality management, I think the focus is usually on the specifications of a product. However, if a company steps back to determine what the risk is in that um, is in producing a product with poor quality, the importance of quality would be greatly elevated. So. For example, take a look at these logos. As you know, there's some of the top brands in the world. But another thing they have in common is they are also responsible for the biggest recalls to date. Um, and I'm just going to highlight a couple. In uh, 2010, Toyota had a recall of 8.1 million vehicles due to a gas pedal issue. Overall, there were 89 deaths resulting from the issue, and it cost the company $3.2 billion. In 2000, Flarestone was responsible for tires failing, and the treads were coming off, and that resulted in 271 deaths and 800 injuries. They had to recall 6.5 million tires, and it cost the company $5.6 billion. And since they're a big supplier to the auto industry and to Ford, um, the Ford SUV suffered losses as well. Ford had to recall and replace 13 million, uh, 13 million tires, which cost them $240 million. And then finally, another company, which is not as familiar to consumers until recently, but very well known to everybody in the auto industry, is Takata. And starting back in 2008, they were making faulty airbags and were required to recall 100 million inflators worldwide. This recall affected 34 of the top car companies, including Toyota, Audi, BMW, um, Tesla, just to name a few. And the total cost of the recall was $24 billion. And as a result, they had to file bankruptcy and their surviving assets were sold to their largest competitor. So when it comes to quality, it's important that companies invest in the training, the testing, and systems to ensure consumer safety, um, company and brand protection, and profitability. 
And when we look at the Firestone and Takata examples, that really shows you the importance of visibility across your value chain partners or your suppliers and contract vendors. So uh, today I would like to briefly discuss the importance of quality in manufacturing and how risk management supports quality and other shop floor processes like EHS. Um, I also want to review some initial steps companies should focus on to set the groundwork to, ach uh, to achieve quality excellence and plan for new technology advances like uh, Industry 4.0. Then I want to talk about how quality and risk management enhances internal operations and how to expand those processes across your value chain partners um, so that you can ensure quality throughout the process. And finally, how do you build your business case to get executive buy-in? Um, so these are just some of the topics that I want to walk through today. Okay, so there's two schools of thought associated with quality and manufacturing. It's the I must do or I want to do. The must do always is connected to compliance requirements. So with ISO 9001, it defines the criteria needed for a quality management system and includes a focus on continuous improvement. So companies who implement a quality system find it easier to standardize processes across all their global facilities and then reports can be generated to view those you know, opportunities or risks or issues in a consistent way. So you're talking apples to apples and it's not a, a mixed um, a mixed batch. And since ISO 9001 is the only ISO standard that can be certified, companies can really showcase that certification to their customers and even their prospects, which is often the requirement needed uh, before an organization will do business with you. Then when it comes to the want to do's, they're the actual business drivers. The focus should be on implementing a quality management system to improve the level of quality in every process and every product. The reason you want to do this is to standardize those quality processes so you can improve the consistency of your output. And um, when you're able to reduce those variances in your process, you can also reduce the amount of costs associated with, say, rework or scrap or even employee overtime. The obvious reason to produce quality product is maintaining customer confidence, customer satisfaction, and brand retention. So when you're, um, when you're doing product recalls, that can really have a negative impact on your sales and your brand reputation, especially in this time of social media and instant news. So the founders of quality management, and I think a few of you probably already know them, like Dr. Edward Deming or Philip Crosby, both taught the importance of quality at the pre-production stage. Their motto was always do it right the first time. However, when that doesn't happen, companies end up suffering the impact of the cost of poor quality. So what is that? Um, when you identify and track those costs, it helps paint a picture for senior management uh, on how important quality is to the company's bottom line. Because it's not enough to say that one batch failed inspection and the loss is the cost of those raw materials. You need to add in all those direct and indirect costs associated with the nonconformance, such as the cost of retesting, or scrap, or rework, replacement production, um, production and order fulfillment delays, and all those other items that are listed on this graphic to the right. And this is a, a popular graphic that I first came across when I was managing a Six Sigma project at GE. It shows the direct costs are just the tip of the iceberg, so you, you, you can easily identify those. But when you calculate all those other costs associated with that nonconformance or that issue, the, those costs can really skyrocket a project. And that's why um, calculating all those costs can really give insight into how important quality is. 
So according to Six Sigma calculations, the cost of poor quality can cost companies between 15 and 40 percent or more of sales. Or we can refer back to the product recall examples we reviewed in the beginning of the webinar to see how expensive poor quality is. After all, who plans for billions of dollars in poor quality costs? I don't think that Takata did. So the quality management process, that provides the foundation for managing on conformances through investigation, then root cause analysis, and finally to corrective or preventative actions or CAPAs. It also issues a management of change or MOC, and that indicates changes either in a process, a procedure, or even a system, and then training would be scheduled with employees to educate and reinforce those changes. Current and historical versions of those documents for all product processes and procedures, they need to be saved for internal reference or in the event of an audit. Although ISO 9001 doesn't specify a product or electronic document system, it's, it's really easy to use a doc control system that automates the storage, retrieval, review, and approval process for you. So by supplementing your quality process with a risk management program, you can proactively identify all relevant risks and quantify the probability and severity of those risks. The guidelines on implementing risk management best practices, they can be identified in ISO 31000. The ultimate goal is to really link those manage, risk management processes with existing Schopler processes to create this visibility across the enterprise and across the partner network too, to identify risks and opportunities that could impact the business. So there's several schools of thought behind risk management, and that could include uh, failure modes and effects analysis, or FMEA, um, hazard analysis and critical control points, or HACCP, very popular in the food industry, and fault tree analysis, and there are just a couple of them. But the basic steps behind risk management, that includes risk assessment and analysis, risk evaluation, and risk treatment and response. A lot of overlap if you start comparing it with quality management. So while many organizations still use spreadsheets to track risks, and um, especially with the FMEA, which is very complex, um, the process tends to have its shortcomings. Records end up being outdated, inaccurate, and the most current versions are siloed in someone's computer. So updating to a risk man management module, that allows users to easily convert that qualitative information into a quantitative data so risk scores can be assigned and tracked in dashboard reports. Now risk management team members and the senior team can review these reports in real time to view the current status across the facility or the enterprise. And once this information is set up in a system, you can use it to create audits on a mobile device to monitor those, those areas effectively. You can even add photos to the audit findings if necessary. If there's a problem with an equipment, um, or a valve or something, you can take that photo and, and add it, and that'll help you um, uh, address it with the team. So it can be difficult to see how risk and quality work together. For example, when you think of risk, it usually involves the pre-production stage. But quality covers um, pre-production, work in progress, and post-production. So it's like the whole um, beginning to end phase. On this illustration, you can see a list of the risk management processes on the left and the quality management process on the right. They seem to have very little in common, but when you start to connect the dots, you can see how they share information and processes. For example, a hazard analysis done in risk management, but it provides the quality team with key areas in the facility to monitor and audit 
to ensure risks are being controlled. So whether it's a piece of equipment, calibration, or the maximum number of production runs before maintenance, everyone from management to shop floor employees understands the limits and controls to manage those risks. And risk management relies on quality processes like audits, investigations, CAPAs, MOCs, and they are there to manage and address those risks that are elevated. It's, it's sort of like you could say it's a symbiotic relationship because it elevates the organization's continuous improvement efforts to the next level. So you're not just being uh, reactive, you're being as proactive as po possible. So according to uh, recent LNS research, the top quality management challenges for manufacturers include some of the things we've already covered. There are some problems with disparate quality systems and data sources, and I'm going to cover that shortly. Um, but another challenge is that quality metrics are not effectively measured, which is often true. When a company monitors the cost support quality and then tracks the effectiveness of the quality management system on say resolution timeframes or order backlogs or reduced deviations, and then they tie it into increased profitability at the company, senior management sees the value of those systems and then the standardized process workflows, and that really has an impact on the bottom line. So they're starting to see how there is an ROI in place for a quality system. The next challenge would be the idea of quality. Um, it's, it's really just a department. It's not a responsibility. Well, this is definitely not a mindset. This is definitely a mindset that needs to be addressed. It is up to everyone in the facility to monitor quality. I can't stress that enough. When you, you know, whether you work at the dock door or human resources, purchasing, maintenance, or any other department, you have a true impact on quality. You see raw materials are shipped with the wrong labels. You can notice a, a production line employee is sick. A vendor's products are out of spec the last three shipments. A machine is overheating. There's so many other variables across the facility or even the enterprise that could impact quality. That's why it's really important for everyone to be involved. That's why even risk-based thinking matters when you extend quality beyond the quality department. So there's so many ways quality can be affected that it's up to everyone to contribute to quality and the safety of products produced by the organization. And as you can see here, the fourth highest challenge highlights that there's no formal process for managing risk. I know it seems to be a, a key key word out there in the industry when management says, we need to focus on risk management this year. Well, um, you know, I think there's truly a way you can do that and you need to automate those processes and those identifiers so that you can capture that information more successfully. And as we just discussed, risk and quality do support each other and they should be systems that are integrated together so information can be shared. So you want to bring attention to high visibility recalls and safety events um, that provide motivation for the company to build out their risk programs and engage employees at every level of the company. Everybody should have a, a, a voice at the table when it comes to quality. Um, also, the supplier and contract vendor visibility is very important to ensure safety and quality of finished goods. Um, unfortunately, most organizations still lack that transparency and collaboration needed to, to do this effectively. Uh, I'll, I'll be discussing this on, a, on one of the other slides coming up. And nonconformances. This, this seems like a no-brainer because the, the most important step um, and the most central component of quality management is a nonconformance. So if you're not properly investigating and correcting a nonconformance, the problem will be will continue to occur and costs are going to start to escalate. 
I've seen the paper-based processes fail too many times because they aren't properly followed through on and they result in bigger issues and, and higher costs down the line. So when you begin to look at how to make changes internally, you want to first start by creating a foundation for success. The latest buzz for manufacturers is transitioning to an industry 4.0 model. As many of you are also, oh, as many of you already know, this trend will expand the use of computers and automation we're using today, but it will also include increased automation and data exchange through such things as the Internet of Things or cloud computing or even artificial intelligence. And what they're trying to achieve is that smart factory. But before this can happen, companies need to update some of their existing processes in order to build on these new technologies. The first thing companies need to do is transition from a paper-based process to digitized data. Paper-based records usually end up outdated, incomplete, and missing approvals. And according to a study sponsored by Xerox, 46% of employees, and this was a study in U.S. and in Europe, 46% um, of employees waste a considerable amount of time on paper-intensive processes. And it goes on to say that 81% of the responders expect digitization to streamline the process. And also, with, um, with some additional LNS research, an estimated 78% of companies, they're still using paper-based processes to manage their quality and even their EHS shop floor processes. So automating those processes in an EHS queue system actually um, allows workflows to be streamlined. It automates, um, it automates processes and it results in greater visibility during that investigation and CAPA process. So um, it really ties into an, organization, an organization's continuous improvement efforts and initiatives. So um, focusing on those uh, quality management system processes really helps to support that. And finally, Connecting systems to enable data sharing across the enterprise provides the transparency that companies need to collect that data across multiple siloed departments. So you really don't know what um, environmental is doing or health or safety and quality is operating in a different silo and production and operations, they're operating in different silos as well. But when you connect those systems, this provides management with this comprehensive view of the entire operations and, and to see if there's any trends or issues that should be proactively addressed to reduce the risk to quality and, um, and how does it impact employee safety and other areas of the business. So these are just um, foundational changes that will allow companies to start to create this dynamic system of data that can collectively address risk and opportunities across the enterprise. So now as we move forward with this new automated foundation, we can start to easily identify areas within the facility that need to be addressed. Uh, processes for managing quality require special attention to issue identification. So whether it's a non-conformance, is it an audit finding or even a customer quality complaint? Each must trigger an investigation and connect it through the process to a corrective action so it can properly resolve the issue. And automation provides that standardized workflow that requires completion through to a CAPA. It also centralizes that data to allow a comprehensive view of the process the production lines, the facilities, um, assets, and other variables across the enterprise. And this allows you to drill down into trends, anomalies, 
um, and then be more proactive with your operations management. So instead of being reactive to issues, you're proactively managing things. And the people within your facility, they're key to making your products and processes, eh, processes more effective. The health and safety of your employees is not only key to maximizing output, but also producing quality products. One of the highest risk factors identified by the FDA is the risk of contamination by uh, an employee who's ill. So whether it's visually identified by the production manager or through standard lab testing, contagious employees have to be reassigned until the issue is resolved. So having integrated quality, EHS, and other enterprise system provides alerts to address sanitation requirements, QA testing, um, HR reassignments, um, and inventory holds. So there's, um, there's a, a verified process, so no risk um, of product contamination or release of contaminated product into the supply chain. So whether it involves training to reinforce MOCs or operational health or safety, um, working with employees to reduce the risk on the shop floor is key to making quality successful. And finally, want to perform a risk analysis on the production line, your equipment, and other assets and this is gonna allow companies to determine how the system can be used and how often before, say, maintenance repair operations or MRO service is required. It will also identify critical areas that need to be closely monitored based on, say, previous incidents or observed weaknesses. And equipment SOPs should also define how each production line should be cleaned and sanitized based on the products being made there. A concise review of the equipment ensures that equipment is operating within specifications to product quality standards. And I wanna share a situation that happened at a chemical company. Um, the quality manager was performing a routine test on production batch samples. And it was to verify uh, specifications when she was filling out the product sheet and she noticed farm material in one of the top selling products. So of course her internal alarm goes off. Everything's um, based on paper-based processes. It's, it's not an automated company at the time. Um, so she did additional testing on other samples and um, she found that the batch still had uh, issues associated with it. So she had to put a hold on the entire batch and she notified the operations director and the product manager that there was foreign material in batch, say it was 240. She, test, she ended up testing other batches and she found the same contamination in four other batches. And they had the same issue and they were all produced on pro, production line three. She discovered that the small particles were metal and these batches were quarantined in the warehouse and in, e in the ERP system. If you don't qu quarantine them in the ERP, they will be released into um, the supply chain. So it's really important to connect both um, physically in the warehouse and with your ERP system. The operations team began to investigate the root cause of the issue and they found that a screen fell off and into the production material and it was ground up into metal fragments. The reason it fell off is that the clamp was loose and it didn't hold the screen properly. A corrective action, action was issued to replace the screen on production line three and a preventative action was issued to inspect and replace any other faulty clamps in the facility or in other facilities around the enterprise that use that same uh, part. So the finished goods material, that only cost the, set, uh, that only cost the company $75,000 and that included the packaging because it was already down packed. Um, the cost mm -hmm. to shut down a production line for a few days in, 
including quarantine materials, recalling and replacing finished goods, delaying customer orders, and compensating customers for any product costs from using contaminated materials used in their production. That cost over $750,000. So when you start adding up those direct and indirect costs, um, you see why automating quality and overlaying it with a risk management um, plan enables greater insight to potential issues and allows organizations to quickly respond to an issue before it enters the supply chain. So this is really key. So by automating, you can take those steps and compress them into a tighter time frame for addressing that problem, and you can reduce the cost as well, because if it doesn't make it out to the supply chain, your costs are going to be um, much lower than if you release it. And as you can see here, it was 10 times the cost of the raw materials. So let's review the importance of quality outside your enterprise. Companies today have hundreds or even thousands of suppliers and contract manufacturers and packagers, and they're, and they're global. They're all around the world. This leaves organizations wondering about the quality of the vendor output and the risk on the final product. With an estimated 52% of product recalls tied to supplier and contract vendor issues, it's more important than ever to increase visibility across the value chain to ensure compliance and quality. So you need a quality management system that enables that supplier management piece. You want to be able to create a central repository of information on each supplier. It's going to have to include their locations, their contact names, any accreditations, and documents such as product sheets or um, country of origin documents and any other information. This way, the team has access to the information instead of relying on a gatekeeper such as the purchasing manager. Um, so everybody should have access to this information, especially when it comes time to production and they want to validate those specifications. So you should also be able to gain visibility into your supplier or vendor quality processes by integrating them into your own quality system. The system should provide the flexibility to send non-conformances to your contact at the supplier location. So having a, a SaaS platform enables um, companies to issue permissions to their suppliers, so that will activate the collaboration needed to address a nonconformance. Um, and the supplier would be able, uh, would also be responsible for opening up an investigation and determining the root cause of that issue. Um, and then the corresponding CAPA would be updated in the quality system to create a complete audit trail in the event of a compliance audit. So you want to make sure that your suppliers and your partners are compliant with the way you manage your quality so that when you are questioned about it, you need to confirm with, say, an inspector or an auditor that your processes are up to date and you have visibility with your partner network. The system should also have proper security and permissions. Um, and they should be integrated to secure the privacy and integrity of, of not only your data, but your partner's data or your supplier's data. And so that still allows great visibility across the value chain, but it also controls who is looking at your system and the data inside it. But how do you incorporate risk management with your suppliers? Well. Um, in, in our particular situation at Cordy, we pull data into our reporting tool and we add, a, we pull in different um, factors such as on time deliveries, number of conformances, number of days to resolve the issue, any number of variables. It depends on the KPIs that, that a company wants to monitor. But we develop a, a vendor scorecard for each supplier. This 
this provides an overview of your vendor. Um, it, it scores your vendor on whether they're high, medium, or low risk. And this can help when you want to schedule on-site audits um, or if you want to you know, negotiate your contract. Or in an extreme situation, you want to identify that it's time to find alternative suppliers. So it's really helpful. It's a great collaboration tool um, that when you work with your partners, you know who you're working with and that issues can be resolved more proactively. So another industry case study involves a raw material supplier to hundreds of companies worldwide. In 2009, there was a salmonella outbreak for products manufactured by the Pina Corporation of America. There were 361 companies who used the contaminated raw materials in over 3,900 products, including peanut butter, cookies, crackers, trail mix, and packaged Thai food. As a result, nine people died and 700 illnesses were linked to the contamination. Although major peanut butter brands did not source from PCA, many, comp uh, many consumers avoided peanut products completely, which resulted in a 25% drop in all peanut butter sales, and the entire peanut industry suffered losses of $1 billion. The supplier had to declare bankruptcy, and executives faced criminal charges for knowingly distributing contaminated product. And what's even more alarming is that not one of the 361 companies discovered the contamination issue before or after production. One company did report that they had identified PCA as being a high-risk supplier, and they banned them from their supplier list. Unfortunately, that information was siloed in their headquarter files and not accessible to other facilities. As a result, one facility continued to purchase their ingredients from PCA and they used it in their production. So the company had to announce a recall and remove product from the supply chain and store shelves. So it's that lack of transparency across the enterprise that's, that is leading companies to look at how to automate quality management and store that information in a centralized repository to reduce those incidents and pr protect consumers more proactively. So let's talk about building the business case for executive buy-in. Okay, so what are some of the steps? And I'm going to, I'm actually um, finishing up a, an ebook with some um, more details on this, but I definitely want to highlight this for anybody who's looking to develop a business case. First, you want to identify the decision makers um, and, and what, what is their focus. If the CEO is involved, make sure you tie it, this project into one of his strategic goals, his or her, sorry, um, if they fit. Like, is he talking about continuous improvement? Is he talking about reducing costs. Um, these are some of the key things that you should be picking up on so that you can position this as a natural fit for implementing a QMS system. Um, again, if, it, if it's the CFO who's involved, and it's usually a team of people, so you, you probably want to pick and choose what you're, what you're projecting, but um, if the CFO is involved, you want to show how QMS reduces the cost of poor quality and increases profitability. So just understand the needs of your management team and show how QMS supports those issues, um, if possible. Don't make stuff up. <laughs> um, and then, you know, complete a project definition and needs analysis. So you want to define the project itself and why a change is needed. Um, you know, so you want to make this comprehensive assessment of the current situation, and you want to include any resources, current processes, and how the um, how performance is currently measured. Uh, you also want to um, determine objectives and what are the desired outcomes to the implementation. Um, what will the team deliver and, and who needs to be involved in the team? IT helps to 
um, I'm sorry, uh, IT is also a good partner in this because they can help you identify um, key areas in uh, systems where you can attach into those different uh, enterprise systems and gain valuable data sharing. Um, it also helps develop a, a formal gap analysis. You want to list aspects of the current process, processes that are not being met. Um, you want to highlight those gaps, you want to prioritize them, and you want to include them in your monitoring. And then address the ROI. You know, present the solution, explain why the investment should be made, and how the business will see a return on that investment. It's a good time to include that cost of poor quality in your analysis. So you can show the business um, what you will gain by implementing a QMS. And then success criteria and measures. Um, what changes we expect and the KPIs to measure those successes. Um, so you want to be able to analyze everything you're working on um, so you can ensure that you're, you're striving towards the goals that you've set for, for yourself. And the monthly meetings are tremendously important because you want to track those key milestones, any activities, and determine a date to present those findings to executive management. But also those monthly meetings are a great way to level set and see where you are within the process and see if you need to make adjustments because it's, it's you know, a moving target at times and you want to make sure that you're doing everything possible to make the project successful. So those monthly meetings will help you make those adjustments and work with team members to identify those risks. So um, overall, that is the highlight of the presentation. Um, if anyone has any questions, but you know, it's, it's really important to consider quality and risk when you're managing your operations um, with, within your facility as well as with your suppliers. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Kelly. And we do, we do have some questions coming in here, and we're going through those right now. Um, I got a couple uh, up here that I'll I'll shoot at you. And by the way, um, if you have questions, now's the time to ask them. You got the Q and A box should be down in the lower right hand corner of your screen, and you can um, uh, send us your questions there, and we will take them. All right, so. Um, Okay, you mentioned something, uh, there was a term uh, somebody wasn't familiar with, uh, I, I think this person thought you said slash, I think you were saying SAS. Um, oh, if you can sorry. just quickly, well, if you can actually just quickly describe what, what SAS is, software as a service is, and then um, what the benefit of a SAS QMS is versus uh, an on-premise, uh, you know, bespoke software kind of thing is. Okay, great. Yeah, sorry about the Philly accent. <laughs> I have a little accent there. Um, but a, a SaaS solution is basically a cloud solution. Um, I've, I've worked um, with companies that provide it on-prem or SaaS. I mean, on-premises um, implementations, there's usually higher cost up front, and um, there's more maintenance and service fees associated with it. So, so you're going to see that upfront cost. Um, it ends up being a little more structured than a SaaS solution too because you implement a solution, you have someone set it up for you, and um, you're not able to get those upgrades to the um, features and functionality as quickly as you need to. But it will work effectively um, for a period of time to meet your needs. When you have a SaaS solution, you have less costs up front um, and it's easier and faster to implement because everything's in the cloud. You need less IT resources. Um, and, and those system updates, they're done, say, a couple times a year. In our case, we do three up, updates a year, and it's no impact on the business. Um, it just um, seamlessly integrates those new functions and features within your system and that you can start using them right away. But it doesn't impact the overall system that's storing your quality management. And um, especially when it comes to updating, you don't have to pull in a big services team to do those upgrades where it's almost like you're implementing a brand new system. SAS gives you that flexibility 
and that cost savings that um, that make it more affordable for a lot of businesses. And, and I guess I would add that that even if you have a um, even if you have an IT department and IT people. Uh, software as a service just makes their job a little bit easier. Uh, they can be less involved maybe in uh, in this type of software and more involved in doing the, the kind of the day-to-day -day nitty-gritty IT stuff that uh, they're usually deluged with anyway. Great point, Dirk. Um, so you also, you used the term MOC. Can you just define that real quick? Oh, sure. Um, you know, once you do a corrective action, um, usually you'll issue management of change, and that's a change in either a process, a procedure, a system, whatever, um, and that's a permanent change to, um, to the overall business. And then you need to train your employees on that change so that they're aware of it and they don't you know, fall back to the old ways of performing a process and then it's outdated. And, um, so it's, it's really about um, managing the change within your facility um, and moving forward. Okay. Um, we keep copies, this question here, we keep copies of our records and documents in a shared drive on our network. Why would we need uh, document control? Oh, okay. Um, good question. I do hear that a lot from, from our customers. And, um, you know, ISO 9001, they require certain records, you know, whether it's your non-conformance documents or corrective actions, um, so you can prove evidence that a process is being performed. Um, they don't indicate whether it needs to be paper-based or electronic, but um, it becomes difficult to manage thousands of documents across any product or process um, unless it's easy to store and locate. Uh, so network share drives, they're difficult to organize, maintain, and keep current, and it's hard to find the most current version of a document. So when you have a doc control system, you can easily store those documents and, and you can link them to your non-conformances or CAPAs um, with a hyperlink, and it provides that complete audit trail. So you can also distribute documents for review, for changes, approvals, and you can schedule annual reviews to meet those uh, compliance requirements issued by either the FDA or, or ISO. So it, it's, it's a great tool just to manage those documents that are such a headache to most of us. <laughs> um, how, does a quality management, how does a quality management system support product recalls? Oh, this is a good one <laughs> because I was involved with one, so that's I, I do remember my uh, recall days, as you as you can tell. Um, so um, quality management is great because it, what it does is it starts to integrate with other systems, so it'll connect your ERP, your MES, um, uh, your warehouse management system, whatever, and it provides that data sharing. So it's it enables visibility into production runs and quarantining material, um, QA testing, or you know a bunch of other functions. Um, and it also interfaces with CRM to allow us to capture those customer complaints, and we can process those through investigation to see if a recall is needed. But um, you know it coordinates the campus. Um, corrective actions and change management um, to prevent those reoccurrences of uh, nonconformances from happening. Um, so instead of operating in one system, you can share data across all systems and, and you have that greater collaboration um, to coordinate things in a quicker and more cost-effective way. So that helps reduce the impact on time, resources, and just overall costs. Okay. Um, this question, you and I have actually talked about this b before, but uh, it's probably worth um, addressing this here. Um, how do you deal with, <clears throat> excuse me, how do you deal with supplier or vendor processes and controls when they indicate they are proprietary? So we, we've talked about, uh, you've talked about, uh, you know, kind of the global supply chain and, you know, visibility and transparency and stuff, but sometimes, you know, you got these uh, proprietary <laughs> issues. 
That's true. I, I know a lot of companies are like that. They're a little worried about people getting behind the firewall and, you know, seeing things they're not supposed to see. So I, I definitely understand that. Um, and and with, you know, with our solution, I'm going to use our solution because I, I know what it's capable of. It, it gives you that, that um, connection to your suppliers without revealing what's behind your four walls say or if your supplier um, has proprietary information uh, proprietary details on producing a product um, in a specific way um, we're not going to be privy to it um, but we're going to understand the quality processes behind it and the resolutions and corrective actions that that we can share with each other in a, a secure site so nobody's violating anyone's privacy but we are sharing and collaborating in a detailed way um, through a SaaS platform. Okay. Um, what is a good way to measure, what, would, what will be a good way to measure the success of risk management? <laughs> Excuse question, how do you know you've gotten there? <laughs> um, you know, I, I think it's, nobody wins an award for, for not having an, a recall. Um, it's almost like you you don't get any glory or fame for doing risk management or quality, um, but it's the best way to preserve a company's brand. Um, so I guess monitoring um, it, through audits and through um, performance measures through your, your non-conformances or through your hazard analysis or failure modes. You want to identify all those key things um, and you want to draw in some historical data as well and where they, they were impactful and, and expensive in the past or they caused a lot of disruption, whether it was a safety incident or a product recall. Um, you collect that data and you start to compare it to what you're, you're achieving going forward. When you see a drop in your nonconformances or your safety issues or um, your cost, you're going to be able to see that the risk management is really working and you can actually, you know, perform that return on investment, that ROI that management is looking for. So, um, you know, the, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, but it also gets the worst social media focus as well. Um, so being, being considered a, a valued brand in the industry and a trusted brand, that's what you end up seeing as part of a successful risk management program. Okay. Um, I didn't hear what you said about metrics. How do you determine the correct KPIs? Oh, okay, great. Um, well, it, for example, um, in the past we were working with a, a company and we were monitoring their incidents, um, their, their backlog, incident backlogs, uh, quality backlog, um, days of resolution, and um, uh, quality nonconformances. I'm going to use that as an example. Um, so you can monitor your supplier that way, you can monitor your internal facilities the same way, and you start tracking based on those KPIs, and you can change them. It could be something like um, delay in shipment um, or whatever it is. So you pull in the KPIs that are most important to you, and you can start to identify them and then address them with your, say, supplier or with your shop floor employees in a certain um, production line or a certain um, shift. And this way, you're proactively managing things that seem to be a little higher than you were planning on. Um, and so the KPIs will be collected and pulled into your reporting tool. Say within QWERTY, we can track all that. And then we can provide dashboard reports to see to visually see what is going wrong with the facility, and you can drill down to de determine where those problems are occurring. Okay. Um, you know, we had a couple. Um, we had a couple questions, and actually, they're, they're common questions that come up very often related to uh, RPN uh, values. 
and um, I think there is some uh, some confusion over how these are used. Maybe you can just describe just briefly, uh, just a couple of examples. Uh, should action only consider high RPN values, or should it also take into account the severity of the uh, of the impact? And you know, we also have you know the risk rating number, recurrence rate. I mean, there's so many different ways of, of calculating that RPN. So maybe if you can just kind of do a brain dump sure. a little bit on that, if you mind. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Um, and it's my new favorite topic. <laughs> We've been talking about <laughs> <There we go. laughs> um, with, with two of our, our um, new customers. So um, it's you want to you want to calculate something that that is high risk, but it's either going to be based on um, low occurrence, so it's not happening very often but very high risk or um, um, failure rate. Um, so it could really impact business or um, safety or some environmental concern. That's going to be a really high risk, but it's very low probability. Um, and then you have something that occurs more often, but it has a, a medium risk. So it's not something that is, is seriously going to injure someone, but it's something that will still contribute to the cost support quality. Um, so you want to address that because it's very um, repetitive and it, it happens more often, it's costing the company more, but you really need a plan in place for those high risk incidents. Um, I, I know one of the, um, the, the examples was um, uh, risk of an explosion on um, a chemical site. Um, well, that's very important. Um, and, and there are standard operating procedures behind that. There are safety requirements behind that and, and um, policies to protect people within the facility and identify issues early in the process. So either whether it's um, uh, equipment calibration or uh, temperatures running too hot, that needs to be addressed right away. Um, it, it may not happen and it may not happen very often, but you want to ensure that when it's starting to show signs of high risk, that it, it you completely quarantine it and shut it down so the risk doesn't occur. Um, so it's it's kind of important to to manage um, the the ones that happen all the time <laughs> and you can live with um, versus the ones that that barely happen but they they have ca high casualty or catastrophe associated with it. Okay. So, um, uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Were you, were, were you finished with that? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, and, and, bef and before we wrap up here, um, you had said something early on that kind of caught my attention. And I, 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 if you can just maybe add to it a little bit, you were talking about uh, you know the value of this type of system when you're doing an audit, and then the ability to maybe use your phone to. And I think what you were saying here is to tap into the system to add photos or comments or whatever right out there in in the field. And I'm assuming you were saying that this was capable a capability that's that's part of this type of system. Am, am I right? Uh, exactly. And I know that people have. Um, you know, just accepted the fact that they always had a checklist or a paper document they'd walk around the facility with or, you know, do a site inspection with um, at their supplier. Um, but having that, uh, you know, mobility connection, um, it d gives you a lot more flexibility to record information. Um, it come, you know, it has the uh, option of providing several different languages. Most of our companies we work with are are international, so it's really convenient to have those multi-language systems in place, and, and it captures that information in real time, and you can store, um, you know, documents and, and images and you know anything you need, and you attach it to that audit record, and then so basically it's you're, saved you're, in the you're, system. Your QMS in your hand, so to speak, with your yeah. phone. Exactly. Uh, okay. Two messes on the go. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Two messes on the go. All right. Uh, well, we are at the end of our time here. Uh, we didn't get to everybody's questions, but um, for those of you who have been to our webinars before, you know that what we do is we bundle up all those questions, uh, even the ones we didn't get to, 
I'll send them to, to Kelly and the folks at Cordy so that they have a chance to uh, maybe address your questions offline for those of you who we didn't have time to get to your questions today. So uh, Kelly, thanks for the presentation. I appreciate it. No, thank you, Dirk. I appreciate it, too. Hey, no problem. And thanks to all of you again for joining us. Um, you will be receiving an email sometime tomorrow with a link to a recording of this webinar, uh, MP4, just play it in your video player, as well as a PDF of, of the slides that Kelly presented today. And you should see that uh, you should see that sometime tomorrow, so keep your eyes open for that email. Be sure you check your junk email if you don't see it come in. So that is it from all of us here at Quali Digest and Cordy. Everybody have a great day, and we will see you at our next webinar. So long.